G'day guys. Happy Sunday. It's good to be with you again today. I've got a question for you. Have you ever seen a miracle? I mean, have you ever seen something happen that was just so amazing that you just couldn't explain and uh, you just, oh my God, blew your mind and you had to tell everyone about it? That's what we're talking about in a minute. But before we do, I just want to invite you to uh, get up wherever you are, get off your lounge, get out of your bed, uh, get out of your pajamas and uh, enjoy some worship and prepare your hearts to hear God speak to you today. Oh, I believe in something more. Oh, I believe in Christ the Lord. My life begins where He's adored. My life is yours for what it's worth. My life is yours for what it's worth. seen a miracle happen I mean when we see things that we can't explain it really gets your attention doesn't it and the story we're gonna talk about today comes from the book of Acts it's after Jesus is risen it's after he's ascended to heaven he's actually already sent his spirit out and the Apostles are starting to speak about the message of Jesus of salvation and amazing things are happening everywhere it goes so we're gonna dive into the scriptures from the book of Acts chapter 8 and uh, there's a guy called Philip, he's one of the apostles. And that uh, says, now those who were scattered, the disciples were scattered because they were being persecuted in Jerusalem because people didn't like what they were saying necessarily. Those who were scattered went from place to place proclaiming the word. Philip, our main man today, he went down to the city of Samaria, do you remember that name, and proclaimed the Messiah to them. Now, just backstep with me. Has anyone ever heard a story about the Good Samaritan? The Samaritans was the people that the Jewish people loved to hate. Back then, they were like, we, we're not friends with these people. The Samaritans, yep, they're over there. We don't agree with the way they worship. They do things differently to us. There was a long-running feud, right? And so here, with the gospel being proclaimed, you got one of the apostles going down to the Samaritans. It's like, what the hell? This is what happens when the Holy Spirit gets into your life. You start to actually... Go out to some of the edges and the borders of where other people would say, yeah, no, we don't do that. Well, here's where Philip went down to the city of Samaria, to the Samaritans and proclaimed the Messiah, Jesus, to them. It goes on, verse 6, says the crowds, because there were crowds listening. So he must have had the gift of the gab or something. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip. Hearing, now get this, and seeing the signs that he did. So he just wasn't raving on, talking, 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 because he had the power of the Holy Spirit working in his life and flowing through him. It was powerful to listen to him preach, but also he was able to do amazing signs, seeing the signs that he did. For it says, unclean spirits 
crying with loud shrieks. I mean, this was a physical, literal thing they heard. Evil spirits crying with loud shrieks came out of many who were possessed. I mean, imagine being there. And many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. So these people are seeing with their own eyes. There's a guy they've known all their life or a woman they've known all their life, paralyzed, can't walk, lame, stands on their feet and starts walking. And we think these stories are just cute Bible stories because we've heard them before. But guys, it not only did happen then, but can happen today. Can you imagine being there and seeing all this happen? I think you'd be like these people that says, so there was great joy in that city. No kidding. You know, I remember the first time I saw someone get healed. I, for a long time I thought, are these all just make-believe stories or can this really happen? I was in Ireland at the time. I was a young adult. I was traveling around the world. And there was, um, I, I had a friend who I invited to come along to this prayer meeting with me. And, she, and I'd forgotten. She told me she had this bad back for ages. But I was just bringing her along to hear me because I was playing the piano. And I said, come along and hear me play music for a bit of moral support. Well, she's come along to support me, but lo and behold, behold, while it's all happening, they start praying for healing. And uh, someone puts their hand on the, on the lower part of her back there, and next thing you know, she's crying, and she's going, oh my God. I'm like, what's going on with you? What's happened? She goes, I've been healed. I know a pain in my back is completely gone, and it never came back. I was like, what the hell? It was the first time I'd ever seen the power of God do what I... Th- you just don't see that stuff every day. And it blew my mind, but it really built my faith. Now, I know this stuff doesn't happen every day. But I do want to say today that there's something here. There's a power in the original proclamation of the gospel that needs to be reclaimed by the church today. This is how the apostles, the believers, the followers of Jesus operated. They proclaimed the word and many signs and wonders were done through the proclamation of their word. The power of the Holy Spirit was working through them and it sort of testified to their message because of the wonders that were being done. There's something that we're missing. There's something the church today is missing if it's missing the power of the Holy Spirit at work. And I think this is a good picture for us to put in front of us today. So how can we reclaim it? Just a quick question. How, how can we reclaim this power that we just read about there so it doesn't become a fairy story from 2,000 years ago? I think the answer comes down in, in verse 15. So what happens is the, the, the main leaders, Peter and John and the other posse back in Jerusalem, they hear about this stuff happening down with the Samaritans and they go, we better check this out because, you know, Samaritans, come on. And so they go down, you know, and uh, they, Peter and John are sent down. Verse 15, it says, When Peter and John arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. And you're like, what does that mean? We'll get there. The Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So guys, these are people who are new believers. They've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And as a church, we know and believe that anyone who is baptized is filled with the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. The Holy Spirit comes and enters our soul. That's true. So what's this talking about, this second thing where there's almost a a second coming of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands? Guys, the laying on of hands was a strong tradition from the earliest times, from this story on. And in the ministry of Jesus, you see it all the time. He would lay his hands on them and people's sight would be healed. And so what we see here is what ends up becoming a very strong tradition through all the thousands of years in all Christian churches, a laying on of hands for a prayer for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon everyone who believes. And in the Catholic Church, it's, it's captured by what we call the sacrament of confirmation. It's like, yes, often we're baptized as babies and we're prayed to be filled with the Holy Spirit and our sins is washed away, but we, we know that there's a need for more. But guys, how many of you can remember your day of confirmation? If you were confirmed, if you were a Catholic, can you remember when hands were laid on you? When was the last time someone laid hands on you to be filled with the Holy Spirit? 
because what I want to suggest today is this is not meant to be a once-off thing. If we're going to see the power of God enter the church again and this sort of activity happen again, guess where it's going to begin? Not with someone else. It's going to begin with you and with me opening ourselves to receive the Holy Spirit and to be filled, to be baptized, to overflow with the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that our own Pope Francis and many popes before have been talking about. There's been a renewal in the last uh, 100 years in a remarkable way called the charismatic renewal. And it's all about this thing we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's a grace, which means it's a gift. And it's actually available for everyone in the church. And so... I want to say to you today that I think if you've been baptized, if you're a follower of Jesus and you've been confirmed, it doesn't matter. It's like a car sitting in a car park. You can have all the parts. But is is there petrol in in the tank? Is it running? Is the engine running or is it just full of petrol but not running? We can't sit idly and expect the Holy Spirit to be flowing miraculously out of our lives if we're not activating the Spirit's presence in our lives. And, and St. Paul talked about this when he spoke to his young protege, Timothy. 2 Timothy 1.6, he says, For this reason, I remind you, and today, guys, he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He was saying to Timothy, you, you already have the gift of the Spirit in you. I've, I've laid my hands upon you, but it needs to be fanned into the flame. We can't rely on yesterday's grace or last year's grace or a mountaintop experience that happened 10 or 20 years ago or even last summer. We need to continually fan it into flame to keep the gift of the Spirit alive. You know, in a couple of weeks, the church celebrates this thing called Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church when the Spirit came for the first time uh, upon those first believers and filled them with the power they needed to proclaim the good news of Jesus. You and I are not going to be able to proclaim the good news of Jesus in our world without the power of the Holy Spirit. So in these next coming weeks, this is a perfect time for preparation, a perfect time to prepare ourselves so that we could all ask, Lord, come and visit our church again. Revisit us and help us as believers around the world to be marked by that same kind of activity, that same kind of power that we had at first. Help us return to our first love. No matter who you are today, I'm going to say a prayer today and I just invite you to join me. Holy Spirit, you are the soul of the church. You are the one who cleanses and, and, and forgives and heals and in the name of Jesus and you bring the life of God present into us right now in, in this current day, in this current moment. For anyone who's listening, who is needing the healing power of God to enter their body, Lord, I I pray that you would visit them right now. I pray that you would visit living rooms, homes, that you would stretch out your hand to heal and to do mighty wonders in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we call upon the name of Jesus for your power, for your love to fill our hearts, for hope to replace despair and anxiety right now in Jesus' name. Come Holy Spirit, as we open ourselves to you and help us to prepare our hearts uh, so that you would have more room in our lives and more room in our church so that we could be the bride that you are preparing. In Jesus' name we pray. And I'm the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. We're going to talk about this more in coming weeks. So stay tuned and God bless. i
Oh, you play. 